I'm standing, actually standing for Lev. He was the host for this talk. Uh, my name is Zhang. Um, and today we're fortunate to have uh, 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 storage experts from Dell join us to give us a talk on Provega. Provega is an open source uh, system that caters for both uh, streaming and the batch processing. Um, and uh, without further ado, I will let you guys take away. Thank you, Zhang. Yeah, today uh, we're going to talk about Prevega, which is an open source product. Um, we are the people who started it, Dell EMC, but um, it's an Apache 202 license. Anyone can participate in it. Uh, we'll talk about what are the motivations for building it and talk about the design uh, of it. Uh, my name is Srikant, and uh, followed by uh, uh, Tom Kaichuk. And Andre, I'll be talking about different aspects of the product. I'll start off with the motivation of why we did it and what's the motivation for doing this. And then that'll be followed by a little bit more detailed design of how we achieved some of the features that we want to achieve. All right. First of all, so why did we build Pravega? Um, we wanted to uh, build an ideal storage system for stream processing systems, right? You know whether it's Trill or uh, whether it's Flink or whatever might be the stream processor that you choose, uh, how do we really build an ideal storage system that works very, very well? In the process, what we did was we want to build a, a stream as a fundamental storage primitive. Just like you have files and object and all those things and block uh, as the fundamental storage primitives, how can we build stream as a fundamental storage primitive. When I say stream, it's like an append-only log, right? Uh, how can we build uh, this as a fundamental storage primitive, and how can we build in a scalable fashion so that that can become the basis for not only stream process, but also other middleware, which can be built on top of it. That was the thinking about how we started about this project. So, if as you know, uh, any of the database systems, whether it is an Oracle database or, or a key value store, they primarily use a, a log storage underneath for several of their operations, whether it's replication uh, and, and for all those purposes, right? Uh, but they're all proprietary log systems, right? And built for their own specific product. Our, our idea was if you really take this as a fundamental primitive and build it as a scalable distributed system, how can that be used by other systems to build on top of it? So we want the world to look something like that instead of everyone building their own proprietary log storage. And we call that product Pravega, and we're going to talk in details about what the product is and what is it. But our ultimate goal is to build something like this, which is on the right-hand side, where you have Prevega, which actually tears down to a scale-out scale system like a blob storage, for example, in case of Azure, right? And then, um, whether it's a PubSub engine or the stream processor analytical engines or a NoSQL database, or even a search like uh, Elasticsearch or Splunk can be built on top of it uh, instead of the same data getting stored over and over in multiple places. That was the idea. And then what are the sum of, so if you want to build something like that, if you want to have a scalable, we need to give certain guarantees so that other systems that are built on top of it can really take advantage of these guarantees. And some of the guarantees that we provide is, it's durable, of course, um, it's elastic and strict ordering and consistency guarantees. I think that's the most important part. And as we all know, that's the toughest part in, in any distributed system to provide. Uh, today, we're going to talk about how we provide all those things as part of Prevega. Um, well, it's more or less the same thing. Um, all these features are what we're going to pro we, we plan to start with in Prevega. The problem is there are a lot of messaging systems that have been built before, right? And they are the ones which are used for this purpose in the absence of a, a really scalable, durable, consistent log system, right? You can say Kafka and others kind of fill that space, uh, 
but they're not built from that perspective, right? If you know, Kafka was started in LinkedIn as a means for different people to kind of same the clickstream data, take the clickstream data. It, it kind of changed how the existing messaging systems worked in the sense that they didn't store the state of consumer. That's what made it much more useful for big data systems, but not really started off this mechanism where we need to really build a constant stream storage system, right? So we took a different approach from that perspective. At a very high level, our architecture looks something like this. And of course, this shows in a single box, but it's completely scaled out system where uh, the stream abstraction is very simple. You always append at one end and you can read from anywhere, start from somewhere and keep reading in sequence. When you first write, we write into what we call as a tier one storage, which is fast. And it is only used for durability. We generally don't read from tier one storage. Uh, it's also cached, and we generally read from the cache for real-time applications. But the same data is steered into a, a long-term storage, like a blob storage, for example, or HDFS, whatever it is, right? And then the data is read from tier two or the cache most of the time. The tier one storage is primarily meant for, for um, in failure scenarios to provide durability. Because of that, the tier one storage is write friendly. Um, we, we, we don't read from it as a site. Right? And we'll talk about the details about it. But, but we replicate in tier one storage and act back immediately so that you get a fast, um, durable storage for tier one. And then we take that into a more uh, high throughput systems, which are more efficient, not for small writes. Because write friendly, the tier one is also very friendly for small writes, which is what most of the storage systems have trouble dealing with, whether it is a blob storage or HDFS. Okay, so that's the whole high level thing. Let's get into some of the fundamentals of Prevega. All right, in Prevega, a stream is made of segments. A segment is a fundamental, even lower level storage primitive that we use. And a segment is nothing but a, a sequence of bytes that you write into and then you act back so it's durably stored all the time. Just think of it. Now, a stream is made up of several segments like this. And when you write, typically give a routing key which determines which, segments you're, which segment you're writing to for that specific routing key. Right. So that's a stream. The thing is, each of the segment can be on a different box, so you can horizontally scale out this. Um, as much as possible. Um, there is no limit on number of streams, number of segments, or anything like that. Right? You just spread across. And you're, of course, not. And one of the things which helps us is, is very similar to a lot of systems that you might have seen here. You write to a, a segment, and at one point of time, you seal the segment so that you can't write, it to, write to it anymore. Right? But this is a very important concept of how we scale and how we do different things. And, um, how we provide uh, different facilities. This is one of the important aspects to it. Now, stream elasticity. Let's assume you have a stream with a single segment to start with. You're writing to it. And once, you, once your load increases, obviously one single segment can't handle it. Then what do we do? Um, we seal that segment and kind of split the routing keys between two other segments. We create two segments. Now, these two segments can be put on different boxes. In fact, Prevega does this all based on some policies that you can associate to the stream. Today, those policies are uh, the rate at which the data is coming in, both from in terms of number of times and volume of the data coming in, right? So it does this automatically for, for the segments, right? You can keep splitting and spreading out the segments on different boxes. So let's see how does a stream look like. The x-axis is time, y-axis is the routing keys, just normalized to zero to one here. Initially, we start with a single segment stream, right? And once at time t0, we find that the volume of load is too much. So we split the top half of the routing keys to the top segment and the bottom half to the bottom segment. And then time t1, we find that even the top half of the routing keys are getting hot. So we again split it into two. We seal it and split it, the top half of the routing keys again into two. 
like that you can keep on splitting, right? But what we also do is uh, we also merge when we see that the data is, uh, for that routing case, is cold, right? So this is very important because for real-time processing systems, it kind of gives clue for the processes to auto-scale based on the number of segments if they choose to do that, right? Think of this, if the whole Amazon ordering system is one single stream, it's possible to do that. And think of a, a, a zip code as a routing key. Right. At this point of time, and uh, US West is very, very hot, you'll have more and more. The range of part routing keys for stream here on the West Coast will be very small, whereas in Europe, it's night, it'll be large. And your process can accordingly scale up and down. So you'll have a feedback mechanism from storage to do that. In fact, for one of the stream processor, Flink, we're working on automatically incorporating into our, into our product so that we can do that on the fly, right? So uh, the most important, the key regions are dynamically assigned to segments, depending upon the volume. If you take the heat map of a, of a stream, it looks something like this. Right? The light blue is low volume of data coming in, red is high. So at time 11.30, when it's become very red, it splits into two segments. Similarly, on the top, you see a scaled-down event where it merged two segments into one. Right. So at any point of time, a, a um, stream can look something like this. Right? But the routing keys, which are neighboring routing keys, either split or merged as we go. Right. So that is one of the fundamental things, how we scale, right? Because we can, once we split, we can put the segments on different boxes so we are not restricted by the IOPS on a single box, anything like that, we spread across. Okay, so uh, the other thing also is that, as I said, from tier one, we automatically tier the data into a tier two storage. Think of it as Windows Azure storage in your case. It could be HDFS. But we provide the same stream abstraction so that you can go and read it for batch processing if you wanted to do for old data. Right. And as I said, for the real-time processing, most of the time the data is served from the cache. Right. So, so <clears throat> some of the things, the goals that we set out in the first screen that I showed and how we are doing it, so the unbounded stream data, that's because we move the data to tier two so we can have an unbounded stream data. Um, real-time and historical, as I said again, for the real-time, most of the data is served from the cache. It's very important. And also the spreading and merging helps for the process to scale up and down because keeping up with the speed at which the data is coming at you is very important real-time processing. And you can do batch processing because you can access as streams of data even though it is in object storage, right? Or you can directly go to the object store and access too. But we provide the same thing so that when you have a stream processor which is capable of doing both real-time and batch processing, it can take advantage of this storage system, right? Elasticity of stream, I think we talked about it a lot. You know, we split and merge automatically for you so you don't have to deal with it. It's not based on a statically partitioned system like most of the systems are. Because of that, we provide elasticity automatically out of the box so you have to deal with it. And we also provide transactions and exactly once guarantees on top of this. We're going to talk about how we do that in detail uh, in the next slides. But um, we do provide those uh, mechanisms on top of a stream abstraction. And finally, we also provide a distributed computing primitive. What we observe is a lot of these applications you need, distributed applications need some kind of leadership election and they are dependent on something like Zookeeper, which they don't have to do with Prevega because we provide the distributed computing primitive. We're going to talk about that also in our slides, how we provide that. Okay. Um, some of the things, right, you know, in our case, uh, I just want to differentiate between statically partitioned systems in the space and, and Pravega. Um, since the whole key space is assigned to a single stream and, the, and uh, when you want more parallelism, it automatically splits into segments. 
Whereas in a statically partitioned system, you have to deal with all that. You have to bring down your producers, you have to bring down your system and kind of do it that way. I mean, last I checked, Event Hub also had the same problem, right? Because it's statically partitioned. When you start a stream, you have to specify how many partitions. But if you want to repartition, you become successful, then you're in trouble right, with those kind of systems, right? In our case, we just split in, um, put it on different box and spread out. Right? Same case with the read side of it also. The other thing I think which is, this is even more important is in terms of how you kind of spread your data over time and how to, how to automatically rebalance your segments, which we do. Because if any segments become hot at any given point of time, in a statically partitioned system, you're in trouble. Either you slow down your producers, right? Uh, which is which is it you don't want to do because messaging system exists because you want to provide that buffer. But if you slow down your producers, you're in trouble. Or you over provision so that whenever you think you're going to hit that peak volume, you provision to that so that you'll work well, right? In fact, uh, uh, I worked in Microsoft before. At Bing used to use uh, Kafka, and then they used to have this problem. They had to have a huge Kafka cluster. Because Bring is such a good diurnal data, they had trouble dealing with um, a short bursts of big volume, and they had to have a big cluster to take care of that. In our case, though, if it gets hot, we spread it across different boxes, so you are globally optimized for all the IOPS in the cluster as opposed to a, a local thing. I think that's the biggest advantage you get uh, from using a non-statically partitioned system like us, like Prevega. The other thing is stream processors, right? How can stream process? Because as I said, we originally started out with this idea that how can we build the best um, storage system for stream processors, like right? like Trill in your case, and and this kind of gives a picture of that, right? You know, there are several producers which are producing on different routing keys, but we can split it because each segment is a range of partition keys, right? Range of routing keys. So you see the bigger width there of segments. And then now your workers on the stream process side, you can attach one worker per segment, for example. You can use different policies, but one example could be that. And you can change the number of workers based on the number of segments you have, which is automatically done by Prevega. And then because we provide this exactly once guarantees when you write, if you use Prevega as sync, for a batch of, some of the newer stream processes provide exactly once guaranteed for a single job. But if you use Prevega as the sync for a series of jobs, for a batch of jobs, for a pipeline of jobs, you can provide end-to-end -end exactly once guarantees, right? So that's, that's one more thing for stream process can take advantage of this, right? Um, the next thing is, you know, today if you, if you look at it, most of the systems are built that you know, the data is ingested into some kind of uh, missing buffer, whether it's Event Hub or, or Kafka, and then ETL into uh, long-term storage. W what happens is if you have a business model that you've built, or it, it could be a machine uh, intelligence model that you've built, it works of the data that is coming into Kafka, it's operational data. In, in this case, we have an example of a wind turbine system which is sending the data, and this model works off of data coming from Kafka and decides whether to turn off turbine or there's any problem with turbine. And the data is then ETL'd into an HDFS system. But as always, there will all be new business logic, better models that you have evolved. And you want to test if the model is working better or not. So typically that you do with your older data, which exists somewhere else in an HDFS system, and write against that. And once you find that logic is then changing to the life system is where the trouble is, right? You have to cook up things and make a lot of things to make that work. Whereas when you have the stream abstraction all through, right? You know, this business model working on streams, a new one comes because it can go and process the data, the older data. It can go and process it and find out it's working well. And once you're happy, you can just turn off your original business logic. So that is one of the advantages of treating everything as a stream both for an old data and new data that's coming in, which is not what you have because you don't have a system which facilitates something like this, right? Another big change that I, that's going on in the industry, I want to uh, 
give uh, this Lyft's example as a case for what's going on in the analytics world in the industry is that people are storing, of course, even in this case, they store in Kafka. The initial data comes into Kafka, then they pull the data and store it in S3 because Lyft is on AWS most of the time. But if you look at it on the right-hand side, most of the processing is happening off of S3, right? Whether it's Hive and other things. Because object systems are, are scalable and they're available. And, you know, and in some of the cases, like our object store is geographically distributed with consistency against yours. In that case, you have everything that you want from a pure storage system for as a long-term storage. So the processing is happening off of that. But then... You have Flink or something working off of the Kafka data to process data, munch data in some cases, or make decisions for real-time applications and all that. Right? This is becoming more and more standard as opposed to using something like HDFS. But at the same time, people do this because you don't have the, the messaging system or the system which can take small writes, be able to process both real-time data and batch data. Right? Once you have that, because now the newer stream process can do both, because they treat batch as a special case of stream where it's bounded by start and end, um, then um, something like Prevega will be very, very helpful to do. So in short, um, all the things that we have to set out, whether doing batch processing or stream processing on the same system, whether they're reliably, scalably storing the system, and whether it is being able to give clue to the processor as to when to scale, when not to scale, are some of the things that we have set out to, uh, as a promise for Prevega. And uh, I would invite Tom now to talk about how do we do with, with Prevega for the details. So. All right, so I'm going to talk about the Prevega client. It's green. Um, so the Pervega client is a little bit different than, than you might be used to for, for a variety of reasons. But the main one is that when we say that Pervega is a streaming platform, we really mean that it's a streaming platform. And it's not a messaging platform. And so the server, the Pervega server, actually doesn't understand where um, event boundaries or messages or any, uh, any higher level construct. It is dealing with a stream of bytes. So it is no more sophisticated than a, than a Unix pipe or an HTTP socket. Um, it, it has no interpretation of the data that's going over it whatsoever. So it is completely up to the client. The writer is putting in bytes, and it's up to the client to parse those out into individual messages as it sees fit. But to make that work for a variety of platforms, we need to offer a bunch of guarantees. So we have events coming in from writers. There'll be multiple of them writing to multiple segments according to routing keys, as Srikanth described. And we're going to end up fanning those out to different readers. And sometimes those will be shared across, spreading load across many readers. And sometimes it'll be, be dedicated. And there'll often be many reader, independent groups of readers reading off the same stream. Uh, but to make that work, we need, we need to lock down what our guarantees are. And so what we guarantee is that when you perform a write against Pervega, it is guaranteed to be atomic. Uh, the, the whole thing goes in or, or none of it does. Um, and it will always be um, delivered in order on a per-key basis. This is actually implicit in the fact that, that, the, that we're dealing with segments, and those segments are, uh, are not interpreting the bytes. If you think about it, you, the graph that Srikanth drew of uh, segments splitting and merging, you can draw a straight line on any given routing key from one segment to the next, to the next, to the next. And within a segment, we can't possibly reorder or duplicate data because we're not interpreting a boundaries between what, one thing and the next. So if you were to reorder some bytes in there, that's just data corruption. Um, so that's how we guarantee an order, and it's, it's how we and we have some some. Additional semantics I'll get into of how we can guarantee exactly once, which is a very important property that we have. But um, there's some things we don't guarantee notably, which is that we don't guarantee ordering across routing keys. And if you think about it, this makes perfect sense, because if you're going to have multiple readers and they're going to be processing the data in parallel, and you say, well, you know, we're going to partition this by, say, customer ID. Say, that's our routing key. Well, we say, OK, well, we're going to give customer ID, you know, Fred to, to, to one reader, and we're going to 
give customer ID Bob to a different reader, well, they're processing data in parallel, and they're intentionally so, so that you can, you can scale up. And so, of course, there's not going to be any ordering guarantees between them. So it's only when you sort of explicitly lock down and say, this is a data for this customer ID must be processed in sequence, do you get that guarantee to come into play. Um, and similarly, we don't explicitly guarantee that, that, a, that a, it, it, we're not like a SQL database or anything. Like if you, if you have a read call, it's going to open a, a socket and it's going to give you data as data becomes available. We don't guarantee that latency. We don't, we don't say that, oh, you're going to get that data within five milliseconds of it having been written. And that's a very important property because we're going to take advantage of that and some of the things I'm going to show you later. Um, so one thing we do is we maintain strong consistency. And that's a little bit tricky to do because you can have failures. So what can happen is you have a, a worker here who's sending in some data, uh, opens a connection, and starts sending events over the wire. And as those events go in, the connection can fail. At that point, you'll notice we have this counter up here that's at four. That's atomically incremented on every single one of those, those writes that occurred. And so when the worker reconnects, it can ask, you know, where did I leave off? And the server can tell it, oh, you left off at four. And it can resume from exactly that point. So regardless of the, whether or not you're sending a continuous stream of bytes or you're sending discrete events, you can always get a consistent picture of what happened on both sides. Uh, so to do that, we need to have that notion of atomic compare and set. We need to be able to atomically append data and also have this metadata counter that we can atomically update. And that is, in fact, a, a CAS. And that is, uh, I'm going to get into how we use that later on, but it's, it is a very powerful primitive. And in fact, if you study sort of the theory on consistency, it is, it is the strongest form of primitive. And you can build any other uh, model on top of it. And in fact, we do, which I'll get into. Um, so one thing we do with it uh, is we have this notion that we call a state synchronizer. And a state synchronizer is a, is a little bit of a weird thing to wrap your head around because it's maybe not an API that you're used to. But essentially you have a, a log, right? And you can use, a, use a, a segment as a log. And it just writes transitions to that log. So it starts out with some initial state. And then it writes an update. And then another update. And then after a while, you note, oh, OK, well, here's the new state. And write, it writes a compaction of all the updates so far. And then you can resume reading from that point. And you can maintain that consistency using that same compare and set mechanism I described. So what that looks like from a client perspective is you have this append-only log, and you're sending in updates, each one conditional on the fact that you've seen all the previous updates. So if another update comes in and you haven't seen that previous update due to a race condition, because it's on another server, then your update will fail. And you'll find that out immediately. And you can refresh, see the previous update, and, and try again. So that uses optimistic concurrency to give you a consistency of a view of an object on, across a fleet of hosts. Um, so this opens up a lot of uh, interesting possibilities. Um, we use this a lot internally. We certainly use it. Um, I'm going to go into some of the ways we use it on, on writers and readers. But it's a really useful primitive for, for building microservices because it gives you a replicated state machine that can be shared across multiple machines. So you can use this to do host membership, leader election, all those things because it has, uh, it has guaranteed consistency. Um, one of the things we do is we have transactions. Now, the notion of a transaction is on a stream. So it's not on an individual segment. So what you do is you, open, is you open a transaction, and you can write as much data as you want to it. And a transaction can contain many routing keys. It can encompass the entire stream, be spread across many hosts. There's no bound on how much data you write to it, and there's no bound on how long it can be open. But once you decide you've written all the data you want to write, you can call commit. And that commit will be atomic. And by atomic, I mean that it will be guaranteed that all the data will go in, or none of it will. It will uh, all be contiguous on a per routing key basis, so there won't be other things interleaved with it. And that it, will, um, it won't sort of randomly disappear due to some, some sort of failure in, in the meantime, even if, even if there's um, sort of a, an adverse event. The, it doesn't guarantee the same things that we don't guarantee all the time. We don't guarantee the, the latency 
after which commit has succeeded that someone will be able to, to see that data. We don't, we don't bound that just as we don't on a normal write. And we don't, and we similarly, we don't guarantee ordering across routing keys when you're reading across routing keys because that's by definition being done in parallel. So no additional restrictions, but um, it gives you some pretty strong guarantees. Um, and the way that works is that there's, um, there's for each segment in a, in a stream, there's a corresponding transaction segment that gets created. And there's this process we call the controller, which is sort of acting as uh, the manager of that transaction. It's, it's a stateless service. It doesn't hold on to anything in memory. It, and if one instance fails, it can be easy, trivially replaced with another. But it's just a, it's just a point that can be used to, to explicitly coordinate that isn't, the, that isn't the, the writer who's writing to the transaction. It's important that it be a separate process. But other than that, there's no, there's no real requirement there. Uh, and so once it um, decides to commit a report, it'll, it'll propagate that information. So from an individual seg a stream perspective, you can think of it starting as having, say, two segments. Then we'll create two transaction segments as a sort of shadow segment along each of them. And then data will be written to them. And then it, when it gets committed, the transaction segments will get sealed, and then a metadata operation will occur where we merge those uh, transaction segments into the main segment. And since that's just a metadata operation, no data is actually copied, and the transaction becomes very cheap. And since you were writing to a segment that's not really any different than a real segment, there's no sort of per byte overhead or anything on an ongoing basis associated with a transaction. There's obviously some overhead associated with creating one and, and committing one, but it's, those are metadata operations and should be relatively cheap. Um, when I sort of zoom out and show what this looks like from, from uh, the wider perspective, we've got worker is going to call create transaction on the controller. The controller is going to open in its uh, metadata store, which Andre is going to talk about how that works, um, a, a state which says this transaction is open. And then the worker is going to proceed to write uh, write data to that transaction, which is going to uh, um, go to each of the hosts. And when it calls commit, the controller is going to be the one to call commit on each of those hosts. Now, the important thing is that the worker isn't the one who's contacting each of those hosts and calling commit, because otherwise, if the worker died midway through, then you would end up sort of stuck in that transaction half committed. Instead, the controller is looking at that state and saying, OK, well, we, we are in the state where we decided to commit. We're going to guarantee that we're going forward from here. So it's going to call commit on each of the hosts. And if that controller dies, it will be replaced by another host who will see that state and say, oh, OK, well, we need to go finish committing that transaction. So the individual metadata changes are atomic on each of the hosts. And the changes to the metadata here is atomic. But on a cross-host basis, there may be some time lag there. But that shouldn't matter because the, the separate hosts are dealing with separate segments, and there's not ordering guarantee across them. So all of our guarantees are still in, in place. Hmm? If you're reading from the other side, you can read the sum of the host, and the rest of the data will be eventually available, but it can take some time. Yes, there can be a delay. Yeah. yeah, as I said, we don't, we don't have any guarantee of how soon after data is written, or in the case of a transaction after it's committed, the data is available to read. Um, so Shikant showed this diagram in talking about scaling, and where we have um, a different multiple segments, and you know we're splitting and merging, and so on, so on. So we can talk a little bit about how that works. Where on a worker is going to be writing data to a segment, and similarly the controller can say, "Oh, I'm going to scale that segment." And it will seal it and block any writes. And then the worker will contact the controller and say, well, OK, where's the new segment that I need to, to go to since that one was sealed? And it will get the answer. And then it can contact the appropriate host and, and resume sending the data. And it's worth noting that it's important that this um, controller doing the scaling is, 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 the, same, um, is the same concept that was doing the, the transaction commit earlier. Because you can end up needing to do, um, to do coordination between transaction commits and scaling, right? Like if you're in the middle of uh, this graph, right, and you open a transaction here, 
you don't want to end up committing it, like end up doing this scaling and trying to commit simultaneously with the scaling event, right? So we order the transaction commit and the scale with respect to one another. Um, either can go first, right? It's, it's perfectly fine for, for the transaction to open, um, a, a scale to happen, a scale to finish, and then transaction commit. But um, as long as, you know, once the transaction is committing, no scale events happen until commit, committed has been reached. Um, so reader groups are uh, an important concept. They're basically just a group of readers that are collectively sharing events out of a stream, and we work, do that by divvying up segments. And they similarly coordinate with one another um, using that state synchronizer mechanism I described earlier. So when you have a bunch of readers, they get a bunch of events, and one of the readers dies, the other readers will coordinate with each other and say, oh, that reader is dead. Um, you know, we need to redistribute those events and we'll end up rereading them and distributing them across, the, uh, across themselves. So it's using that, that exact same state synchronizer mechanism internally within the readers to manage, um, you know, uh, what needs to be processed and who owns what data. Um, we also have a couple other uh, notions, uh, one of which is um, the notion of checkpoints, which I'm going to go into later, which is essentially a mechanism where readers can explicitly denote where they are in a stream, and then they can, can persist that state on the, on the application side and then resume from that point later. Um, and for doing things like that, uh, we, we similarly use the, the state synchronizer to achieve that strong consistency. Um, so, for example, we have a concept called a stream cut. And what that is, is you can sort of draw a line through the stream in any place that is, that is consistent. Right? So here, this stream cut makes sense because you're, it's, a, it's a point in the stream where you're going through segment one, three, four. Um, it's not, for example, going through both segment one and segment six. Right? That would be that would be an inconsistent stream cut. So, so it's, a, it's a point in a stream that you can logically resume from because it makes sense that you conceivably could have read to that point. Right? It's a collection of the segments and the corresponding offsets in those segments that you can uh, pick up and resume from uh, when you want to. Um, so the way checkpoints work is that they're, they're essentially just managing a stream cut, but they're managing it in a coordinated way. So you'll have a group of readers that are reading from from uh, two different segments, for example, and they'll be pulling data, and they'll coordinate with a state synchronizer saying, okay, let's do a checkpoint now, and they'll see that update, and then react by saving their, their in-memory state or whatever hasn't been persisted in response to that. And once they have done that, they can update that state synchronizer, flush any data that needs to be flushed, et cetera. And once that's been done, they can update that state synchronize and say, okay, I'm done, I'm done, and then collectively produce a stream cut that represents their collective position at the time they receive that notification. And then if later they want to resume from that point, well, they have, it, they have that object and they can pick up and roll back to that point and resume from there later if they need to. What's the use case for having checkpoint across readers rather than per reader checkpoint? Um, to, to reset an application, for example. Um, so uh, um, Flink is a common uh, user of Pervega. And Flink, on an ongoing basis, um, uh, persists every, every five minutes. Um, here, is, here is my in-memory state. And it writes it to its database. And it flushes downstream. And, then it, and it coordinates the, the checkpoint and the incoming. And then if something you know, catastrophic happens, like something doesn't make sense, it needs to restart, um, it can just reboot that job right from there rather than processing from the beginning. If it is a small failure, like it knows exactly what data failed or was inconsistent, it can back up on an individual reader basis. But as a more general failure recovery mode, it will just restart the whole job. And because it's doing that on an ongoing basis, it's not really losing much. Like if it, if it, if it checkpoints every, you know, two minutes, and that's a continuous job that runs all the time. Sort of backing up and having to redo two minutes worth of, of work isn't, isn't a significant loss. 
Um, another concept that we have that, that works very similarly uh, is a notion called a watermark. And that works uh, where there's not only coordination amongst the readers, but there's also coordination amongst writers. So you can have a group of writers that are collectively producing uh, events, and those are being sent into Pervega. And then they can say, well, you know, from my perspective, we're finished with everything before 7 p.m., everything that ever occurred before 7 p.m. So we can just write that to a state. And once you've collectively agreed that, okay, all the data before 7 p.m. is complete, you can note that, oh, yeah, there's a, there's a, this uh, stream cut corresponds to the point of, of we are now past 7 p.m. And you can note that information and, and store that explicitly into Pervega. And then on the reader side, you can um, read those events and receive that mark that was injected by the writers saying, yes, 7 p.m. has passed. And you'll get, you'll get that notification. And so each reader will know the point at which they will no longer receive events prior to a given t time because of that coordination done by the writers. Um, and collectively, what these, these things let you do is you can have exactly once processing end to end. And this, isn't so and this is something we're not aware that, of any other system that does. Uh, here I have an example with Flink, but you know, it's just as applicable for Spark or any other sort of system, where you're, you're reading streaming data in from sensors, and then you're processing it, storing it, processing it, storing it, processing it, storing it. And the whole time, you're guaranteed that even this, this job three levels away from the, the starting point isn't going to have duplicates or missing data or anything else because you've had this atomic consistency of transactions and of you know, um, uh, making sure that the things resume from the correct byte offsets the whole time. You won't end up with duplicates and you won't end up with, with missing events, even, even when it is chained. And uh, as, as far as I know, Pervega is unique in, in that capability. Uh, but to explain how all of this sort of internals work and how we achieve all this metadata consistency and, and uh, uh, precision and how we can do this with low latency and high throughput, I'm going to hand it off to Andre. Thanks. <coughs> so Tom and Shrikant, so far, they spoke about some features that Provega offers. So next, we're going to take a look at some of the engineering that goes behind the scenes, which enable all of those features and make them happen. I'm going to start with a high-level view of the Provega architecture, all the components, and then I'm going to do a, a dive into the data path to explain uh, uh, how we implement some of the most important things that we've talked about so far. So. Uh, one of the most important things is that Provega can run on any commodity server. So it doesn't require anything uh, highly performant. You can run it on any off-the-box shelf server. There are three major components in Provega. The brain of the, of the cluster is called the controller. The controller simply manipulates data, which we store internally inside Provega, and performs leadership election within the cluster. Then we have a number of segment stores which handle the data path. Uh, the segment store uh, manage stream segments and they, like this diagram shows, uh, they uh, tier that between tier one and uh, tier two storage automatically without uh, the upstream layers knowing about it. We also have a client which Tom talked about. Uh, the client issues uh, what we call control, control plane requests to the controller, such as create a stream, open a transaction, commit a transaction. The controller then orchestrates uh, all of those things by communicating directly with the segment stores. But the Provega client communicates directly with the segment stores to do any sort of data path critical operations, like writing or reading. It doesn't have any other uh, uh, hop, hops in the middle. So let's, let's look at how, how we do writes on a, on a very high-level uh, uh, view. So we have a client which writes something. It gets sent to a segment store, which buffers it internally. Then it writes it to tier one, which and then it gets replicated. And then it gets written to the cache and act back to the client. So the important thing is that we only act an event after we have durably written it uh, to our tier one. And similarly, we only make it available for reading after we've written it durably. So otherwise, if something crashes, we don't 
uh, think that we've written it and we lost it, or we've uh, sent it downstream, but then we don't have it again. Similarly, if we have a second one, it's going to go and kill it, write it, uh, replicate, and then uh, write it uh, after the first event, and then hack it. Uh, so a key thing in our performance is that reads are started from writes. When, as you saw, the writes got written to tier 1 log storage, but we never read from that tier 1 storage. We only uh, use that tier 1 for, uh, as an insurance policy in case we crash and we have to recover our state. We serve all of our tail reads from the cache, and if something is not in the cache, then we're going to go to our uh, tier 2 uh, object or file system to, to get it from there. So as you can see, we fetched it from the cache, and we only use tier 1, we only read from tier 1 to reconstitute the, the, the contents of that cache. So we use this term called infinite stream. So um, other messaging systems just store their data locally on a local file system, and that bounds the amount of data you can write by the size of that local file system. But since we automatically tier data to our tier two, and then we transparently provide a view uh, which unifies both of our tier one and tier two, you can pretty much have a stream as big as your cluster can accommodate. So there is virtually no limit other than the hardware of your cluster. Okay, so that, that gave us a uh, overview of the entire Provega uh, architecture. But next, I'm going to talk about the segment store which handles the data, uh, the data path. We also call it the data plane. So we spoke a bit about the guarantees that Provega offers, but Provega cannot offer those guarantees unless the segment store offers some of the same guarantees. So. One of the first thing is durability. We have to store data durably before we act it or we make it available for reading. Otherwise, we cannot even talk about exactly once. We have to guarantee that that is consistent, which means uh, it has to be uh, stored and, and uh, replayed in the same order in which we wrote it. Uh, and we provide exactly once across both tail and historical reads. Uh, our performance is limited only by the hardware. As I'm going to talk in a, in a few slides, uh, we have an ingestion pipeline which automatically uh, optimizes for low latency for small writes, but also is able to handle uh, high throughput when the workload demands it. Uh, tail reads are served from the cache, which means they are going to be visible by the reader as soon as we have uh, written them to our tier one. And since historical reads uh, are fetched mostly from our tier two, which uh, we assume is optimized for high throughput. We are just a pass through, so we're just going to offer the same throughput as it has. Uh, these are four of the features that the segment store provides. I'm going to detail them in the next slides one by one, but I'm just going to briefly talk over them. So, segments are uniformly matched to something called segment containers, and those segment containers are evenly distributed across the cluster. This enables us to scale horizontally and uh, not by increasing the processing capacity of a single machine. Uh, we use two types of uh, storage. Tier 1 is a log storage, which we use for ingestion. And we use file or object or anything else which is similar to that for long-term storage. We have a dynamic ingestion pipeline, which, like I said, optimizes for latency on throughput based on the ingestion patterns. And one of the other things which uh, saves, us, saves us from having to rely on an external metadata store such as Zookeeper, we are able to store metadata internally uh, inside our own segments. So we are self-sufficient for that matter. So let's talk a bit about uh, segment containers. Uh, when you define a cluster, uh, you define a number of similar containers. That's the, that's the current state of things right now, but we have some work underway to uh, be able to change that number in the future dynamically with, uh, while the cluster is still running. Each segment is mapped via a hash function based on its name to a container. And then the containers are uniformly distributed across the cluster. Uh, each segment container is responsible only with the work for the segments that it owns. So it doesn't really care about segments mapped to other containers. Uh, they have to stick to a particular node. That's because in order to uh, enable uh, fast processing of uh, virus operations, they have to keep track of certain state uh, 
uh, and other data related to each segment. So having a round robin approach would not have been appropriate in this case. So on the same topic of uh, horizontal scaling, let's look at how the controller, which is not pictured here, does leadership election. So if we have, let's say, a node failure, let's say we have three segment stores and we have six containers. So the first one, suppose it dies for whatever reason, it becomes unavailable. The controller is going to detect that and it's going to say, I need to go move container one and container four somewhere else. It still has segment store two and three available, so it's going to move one and four to one of the other ones. So it pretty much does a rebalancing. A similar thing happens in the opposite case. So let's say we go from the right to the left. So we add a node. In that case, it's going to choose two containers from each, well, sorry, one from each segment store and add it to the other one. So it's going to go and do a rebalancing. So that's one of the reasons why I say the controller is the brain because it goes and monitors how the containers are distributed and makes sure, make sure that they are always available. So, okay, so Provega in itself doesn't store any data. We don't have any code there which says we have to go store data and replicate. Instead, we have three types of storage that we rely on which enable us to do that. First one is tier one is a log storage, which means we are append only, we, it enforces a single writer pattern, and uh, when you read, you have to read events in sequence, you can't really go and read from a particular uh, position. Uh, in open source, Provega comes uh, bound with Apache Bookkeeper, and this, pro this is pretty much everything that we ever need from it. For tier two, uh, like I said, we need a file or object storage or blob storage or whatever you want. There are, at a minimum, we need four operations. Create, read, write, and delete. We need to be able to create a file, delete it, we need to be able to write and read from it. Uh, that enabled us to uh, come up with the three bindings in open source for HDFS, NFS, and S3 API, but you can plug in anything you want. We have clearly defined contracts, so you can write a little bit of code and you're gonna make it work with whatever you want. In addition, in order to implement the cache, uh, each segment store node has a local uh, non-persistent uh, key value store. Uh, and in open source, we use RocksDB, which is an uh, off heap data storage with this spillover in case you need it, and we uh, back it by an SSD. So you can cache more than what your memory allows you to, to store in it. Okay, so far we talked about bindings. So let's take a little look at the ingestion pipeline. Uh, like I said, this thing adapts a little bit uh, based on your ingestion patterns. It can optimize for latency if you don't have that much load, or you can optimize for throughput if you have a lot of things to ingest in. So I'm gonna take you through seven steps that it does, and I'm gonna show you how it does all of that. So everything begins from the right. The client issues a new request. I want to append, seal, merge, or whatever else to modify a segment. That thing gets transformed into an operation in the segment store, it gets added to a processing queue. The order in which these operations add in this queue is pretty much the final order uh, uh, of the operations. Then we perform opportunistic batching. What does this mean? It means we pick up the operations from the queue, and as long as there are other operations waiting in the queue, we're gonna keep adding them and uh, processing them as much as we can. But if there's only one of them waiting in there, there's nothing else, we're not gonna do any sort of waiting. We're just gonna go and uh, ship it and write it to tier one. So in this example, we have six operations. One, two, three, four, five, and six. One and two arrive at the same time, so they get bashed together. Three, four, five, and six arrive later, but roughly around the same time. Three and four are rather big, so they get bashed together, but four is really big, so you can't really fill on a particular right. So it gets split into two rights. So batch number two has operation three and about half of operation four. Then three has the rest of operation four and five and six. All of these writes get uh, sent asynchronously to our tier one, so which means we don't wait for the previous one to complete before the next one uh, gets sent. And then when you get an acknowledgement from tier one, hey, I've written this and everything before this write, then we are free to first act to the client and we act them in the order in which uh, they were received. And then we add them to our in-memory structures, which means they are available for reading. Uh, 
And then after we have them in memory, okay, well, we have to get them out of that tier one and into tier two. And we have to do this without uh, any user intervention. So we have some automated mechanisms uh, inside the segment store, which based on some uh, triggers, either based on how much uh, data we've accumulated or how much time has elapsed since the last time we wrote, we, we take operations, we bash them together, and we write them to uh, tier two. So let's look at uh, two different segments. You have A and B. And let's assume that these operations are actually writes. So uh, let's say you have four writes for segment A and two for segment B. And the threshold for flushing is somewhere wherever that line is. Now, in this case, uh, we have enough data that we've accumulated from segment A so we can make a large write to, to tier two. Like Shukan said, we are very, we are optimizing for small writes. Mo most uh, file or object stores out there are having difficulty processing small writes, which, which means that in order for us to take advantage of whatever we're bound to in tier two, we have to try to aggregate more operations together so we can have a larger write. So we aggregate smaller operations into bigger write, into bigger writes and ship it together to tier two and write it like that. Segment B doesn't have enough data, so it needs to wait a little bit longer or until it can actually write its data. After we've written this to tier two and we know it's been there, we are free to release all of this uh, data from our tier one. So we go and truncate that so we can make room for more data to, to be processed. <coughs> okay, so, so far I've talked about how do we write data, but let's see how we can actually read that data. Uh, some of the previous two slides uh, said that, okay, after we wrote this to tier one, we add to in-memory structures. One of that is the read index and the cache. That's because data in tier one is pretty much fragmented. It's written into a long log, but we need to figure out how we're going to recompose that into something that can be resembled as a, as a continuous segment. So we have a read index which has uh, pointers, uh, offset pointers to some, to some data fragments. The data fragments themselves are not stored in memory, in heap. They're stored off heap in native memory. In our case, it's RuxDB which can also spin it to disk if necessary if, if we use too much of it. This approach also enables us to do very quick segment merges. So when you do a transaction commit, like Tom said, it's pretty much a metadata operation. We don't have to do any, any I.O. for that. We just have to flip a few pointers and say, okay, we have committed this. A way we can enable this is that when you have two segments in, uh, that you're working with, both of them are gonna have some caches and some indexes. In that case, we just have a redirect for the merged offsets. So let's say you have segment B, which was merged into segment A at offset 11001. We just have a redirect. Hey, for those, for that offset range, just redirect to somewhere else. And that way, it saves us from having to do any sort of expensive I.O. on the hot path, which means our transaction, our transactions in Provega are relatively cheap. So you can have a lot of them at the same time without having any sort of uh, extraneous overhead. So as a summary, here's a little diagram of how things are put together. So on the ingest path, which is on the top, a request is converted to an operation that get put to a queue, then we bash them together by the operation processor, they get written to a tier one. After that, they get sent to in-memory structures, memory log, metadata, and a read index, and they are made available for reading after that point. In the, at the same time, in the background, we have a tier two writer, which reads the operations from the memory log and writes them to tier two. The read index uh, merges the data uh, from memory, or from the, which is stored in the cache, with whatever is stored in tier two. And it provides a unified view of the segment based on wherever the data is, without the user having to worry where, where, uh, where the migration has been. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about is, uh, I said that we are mostly self-sufficient in that we don't have to store metadata anywhere else like in Zookeeper or any other external meta, uh, metadata stores. We have a, num a number of different types of metadata that we have, we have to keep track of. That's number of scopes, streams, transactions, segments, and writer positions, which enable exactly ones on the writer side. Typically, this is how much they are, uh, but Literally, we are, there are, we are unbounded at how much of this metadata we can store because we store it in, in segments which are bounded by the size of your cluster. The next few slides, I'm going to talk about how were we able to uh, store all this uh, metadata internally and access it in an efficient manner, because that's actually the most important thing. Okay, the most basic thing in uh, 
uh, in our metadata is something we call attributes. Uh, each segment has uh, an unbounded set of uh, 16, to 18 by 16 bytes to 8 byte key value pairs. Why those numbers? That's a very complicated thing, so let's just leave it at 16 to 8. In here, uh, the, or the origin of, of, uh, of these attributes was that we, had, we need to have a way to uh, enable exactly once on the right side. So the writers had to store a minimal state uh, uh, for, each, for each writer. So each writer, which was identified by a, a UUID or a GUID, which was 16 bytes, very convenient, uh, had to uh, keep track of how many events it had written so far in order to do a compare and set. So that's how, uh, that, that was the original use of segment attributes. In addition, we expanded that use to do table segments, which I'll describe in the next, uh, in the next slide. So attributes being like 16 bytes to 8 bytes weren't very useful. We needed something that we can store an arbitrary key to an arbitrary value. So based on that, uh, we exposed another primitive called the uh, table segment, which is literally a key value store backed by a Provega segment. Uh, this enable that enables, uh, enables us to do uh, updates, removals, batch updates, removals, and conditional updates and removals. And of course, conditional and, uh, and batch updates at the same time. Uh, so what did we do here? We pretty much implemented a hash table uh, with a uh, linked list to use for, uh, uh, for collision resolution, and we stored all of that into the segment's attributes. Uh, in a nutshell, the way we did that, we hashed the keys to 16-byte buckets using SHA-256, and we, since that is 16 bytes, that, com that is very convenient to, st to stick into one of those attributes I just talked about earlier. Uh, the way we, we process this is we write all of our changes, whether they are removals or updates, into the uh, segment. So we use it as a, as a transaction log. Then we have uh, a, a background indexer, which pretty much reads that and uh, stores the attributes in the attribute segment, which are then being used on the read side to get the location of keys so we can actually read them. So there's nothing too fancy in there, but this allows that, allowed us to break free of uh, limitations that we found with other external key value stores. Since we can store uh, a lot of these uh, keys into, into a single segment, uh, and that can be stored in the cluster, we pretty much uh, were unbounded. Uh, in our experiments, we did the, let's say I generated about 100 million keys and using SHA-256, I got about five or six collisions. Okay, let's say 10. Okay, that's very, that's very reasonable. And if you want to store more, you can just uh, shard across multiple segments and solve that problem. Uh, well, that was pretty much the, everything I have to say. Uh, feel free, we have like 15 minutes left. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. And uh, in the meantime, feel free to go to one of our websites or follow our blog or our GitHub repo and uh, see what we're up to. Segments become large, streams become large, and you're rerouting. Is there data migration happening? Are you moving data across? So, so the question is when, uh, when you have uh, uh, spreading and merging, right? Let's say some repartitioning happening. Yes. And you're adding new keys and you're routing dictionary. Yes. Uh, is there data move happening across the segments? No. Uh, no. So, like Cloud said, so when you have a segment that splits into two, yeah. the, the, we create two new segments, and then we seal the first one. So anybody who's still writing to the first one is going to say, okay, I, got, I can't write to this anymore. It's going to go back to the controller, and the controller says, okay, oh, you have to go right to this new segment. So it's going to continue writing that other segment. So the first one doesn't get touched. It stays where it is. So we don't have to move any data. So. Segments, once they're written, they stay there. We don't have to go and uh, uh, try them open and rewrite them after we split them. Is this redirect communicated to client? And, uh, how yeah. You have it? Yes. Yeah, so, so um, when you seal a segment, that's an atomic operation on the server side that says no more writes can occur to this. And any writes attempting to go in after that will receive an error. The error is going to be internally handled by the client library. 
to, you know, essentially treat it as a redirect and, and figure out where it needs to go now. And when the data is read back, we will calculate from both the segments of the prior one and the new segments. Right. So if you remember that graph, uh, yeah. Okay, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Okay, in there. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. Um, in this case, let's say let's say you're ready to to run key that hashes to point two, right? So at first you write segment zero, you write 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 write, write, write and then you get a you get that error and you redirect and you say, oh, okay, well, I need to write segment two now. And it's going to write a bunch. And then it's going to get another error saying, okay, that one's still two now. And it's going to write segment four. So a reader who's reading that routing key in order is going to read segment zero, then two, then four. So the order is preserved, but, you know, sequentially. Um, you also gave a bunch of examples about Flink. Um, as in streaming engine, uh, yes. we investigated Flink as well. Are there any other um, streaming engines that you are working closely with where Pravega fits nicely? Uh, um, certainly, Spark. We have a connector also. Um, you know, those are those are sort of the big two. Um, uh, I mean, Pravega is not limited. Like it's it has a independent API that you can read and write from, and so it's pretty easy to to spin up new new applications or new new connectors, but uh, yeah, those are, those are the two big streaming engines we, we see. So, is there a notion of truncation from the beginning? How do you guys deal with uh, retention? Yes. Yes, there is. We can, we can, exactly that. We can truncate from the beginning. Okay. And uh, the, the reader's cursors are independent. It's always ever-increasing cursors. Yeah, or? yeah. So, so readers are, um, like, if you have a reader group, it'll be reading starting from a stream cut. And internally, that stream cut is just a map that contains segment offset. Okay, you know? so your your current read offset is related to the last stream cut. Is that a good way to think about it? Um, no, it's it's absolute. So so if if you have a if you if you're a reader and you are reading from segment four, in your memory there is a number that is literally the byte offset where you are in segment four. Okay, and if you take a stream cut. That's just going to record that byte offset in an object, and you can persist that somewhere if you want to resume from that point. Sure. Um, if you, you know, want, and, and that'll just keep going, incrementing up forever, right? So if, if segment four lives for a very, very long time, like that number will just keep getting higher and higher. But you know, it's a long, so <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> but if I say chop out the first hundred gigabytes of that, then no yeah. Longer. So, so if you if you say to this stream, "Hey, I want to apply a retention policy uh, where all the data b before this time t two uh, just delete," we can we can just clear that. And then if you come to us with a with an offset and say, "Hey, I want to resume from back here," we'll say, "Sorry, that data was deleted okay. right here." Like you know, you'll you'll, you'll get that error. And you mentioned that uh, you only read from the cache, uh, not from the storage. Um, yes. What happens when you start hitting the limits of cache and not the streaming job, but let's say there's a cold data processing job which is going over last years of data? When you say How do you limits master? of cache, do you mean capacity or do you mean uh, rate? Oh, you mean the capacity, right? Yeah. So let's say you historical data, that's your example, right? Well, yeah. So let's say you read from offset zero and you want to read 100 bytes. We're actually going to read about one or two or three megabytes. You can configure that. Put in that cache because chances are you're going to want to read the next 100 bytes so and so essentially on. Essentially, you go and read from the storage. And then yeah, we read, from, we storage. read from tier two. Yeah. Yes. We, we, we never read from tier one. Anything in tier one is also in cache, but we moved it. Or excuse me. Anything that is not in tier two is also in cache. But if it's in tier two, we can drop it. And if you read from it, there's just a prefetch because. You know, it's a stream. You're you're gonna read linearly. Like it's it's very predictable. And if you hit the limit, uh, we're just gonna evict some of the unused ones. And if you want to use them again, we're just gonna bring them back. 
any reason that you were reading through the tier zero, tier one all the time, or through the cache all the time, rather than letting old reads directly be served from your tier two storage? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, it it uh, kind of you say why, why, the, why, so if I have a say a, a monthly job that comes in by, uh, and then it'll trash and pollute the cash right so there is regular stuff happening and then you have a once in a blue moon kind of thing it's funny because he and I were just talking about this a few hours ago so we haven't done it because we just haven't gotten to it yet okay. <laughs> that, but uh, it, because First of all, if you want to read in the same order, you have to know what the ordering of these segments are. Second of all, he, uh, you asked about uh, truncation, right? So suppose you want to truncate from this line, or from, let's say, T2. You don't want to keep the whole segment one in there, because there could be like hundreds of gigabytes in there. So what, the way we store a segment in tier two is we, we break it down into chunks and we roll them over. So if you want to chunk it over there, we can just go delete, physically delete those chunks. But we need to figure out a way, uh, if you want to do read the article from tier two, you have to know in which order you want to read those chunks. And also because we, want, we do a, a merging or concatenation of, uh, of segments, that makes it, makes it even worse. And we have a little uh, metadata object for each of these uh, segments, which tells us, okay, this is the order in which these chunks exist. So we are in the process of thinking of an elegant way so we can provide somebody who wants to read directly from, from the underlying tier two, how, they can, how we can pro provide this information to them. So, so, so to answer a different part of the question, right, your concern was like, I have this ongoing you know, process that I want to have low latency and keep up, and then here comes this big batch job and it's gonna just trash my cache. Well, not really because What's going to happen is you're going to have a batch job, yeah, and it's going to read, and presumably it's batch, so it's reading old data, so presumably it's cold, right? And yes, we're going to pull in that data from tier two and cache it, but it's a it's a it's a it's a read ahead cache, and your batch job is presumably reading in order, so it's not like those reads were unnecessary, right? They they were just batched and made larger artificially, but that's not going to like completely destroy your cache because like you know you read ahead one megabyte and that used a megabyte of cache, and then a little bit later you read another megabyte, but you, th you can throw the first one out because you you're done with it, <laughs> right? So, so to really like, like totally destroy your cache, you would have to be doing like random reads from lots of different segments, which is just not the nature of, of applications using the system, right? Oh. They, they, they very much go in order. Also bear in mind that these segments are distributed across the cluster, so they don't live on a, on a single machine. So let's say you're on the red line, you have one, three, and four reading from them, right? Those can be on different machines. So what you're, if you're reading in parallel, you're actually reading with the throughput and the cache capacity of three machines, not one machine. So your ingress and egress rate are, are uh, limited by the capacity of your cluster, not one machine. Thanks. Is there any replication on tier two storage if the containers go down, uh, do, you re do you create that data from cache or is there is replication? So, so we assume that tier two is self-replicated. So, so if you're writing to you know S3, for instance, or SDFS, or right? Like we assume S3 is durable because it acted. Yes, we decided to stay away from that business. Mm -hmm. We we just moved it up between <laughs> tier one and tier two. And by the way, tier one also has to be replicated. That's why we chose Apache Bookkeeper because it does all of that for us. We decided to, to stay away from that business because it's it's a very messy one. So we decided to just focus on the things that we want to. Well, we have enough problems. Yeah, <laughs> if you have a certain surge of number of uh, readers, for example, how do you handle that? So um, you can you can have a surge in readers, but um, the most you can ever spin up and usefully consume is one reader per segment, which is an important reason why you want to like have a scaling policy associated with your screen to have you know have it split into segments as appropriate. Um, but like, if you have you know 100 segments on your stream, and then you spin up, you know, a thousand readers, well, 900 of them are going to sit there and do nothing. But you're because assuming that um, there's the consumer wants the ordering guarantee, which is why you would have. Nice yeah, app. actually. But what if? Yeah, you don't want an ordering guarantee. We we have an API for that. Uh, we have a we have a batch API, which says um, essentially, I don't care about an ordering guarantee. Uh, just like look at this graph. 
and give me a reader that a segment reader for every single segment here, right? So you can say, you know, you can iterate over the segments, and it will give you. It'll iterate over the segments and create readers. So you, you'll start here, and you'll basically be iterating over this graph. And you can create a segment zero reader, or a segment one reader, or a segment two reader, and each of those will read one segment beginning to end. And you can do them in parallel. You can in multiple machines or or a single machine doesn't doesn't really matter. Um, and there you're just reading a segment contiguously, but you can ignore the 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 ordering if you want. You can process segments seven in parallel to zero if you for all for all we can. But yeah, it's a separate it's a separate API because you know if you're doing that, you pr like you probably have a different sort of application. Wow, exhaustive. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.